Hello, 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 and welcome to uh, the official uh, side event of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, which is being co-hosted by Transform Drug Policy Foundation and Mexico Unido Contra Delacuencia. Hope my pronunciation is right, M-U-C-D. Um, Transform is a UK-based uh, NGO doing uh, policy work and advocacy around drug law reform, um, very similar to our colleagues in uh, Mexico, M-U-C-D. Um, who have a broader mandate that includes uh, drug policy. Um, today, we'd like to spend the short time we've got, 50 minutes or so, um, exploring some ideas around uh, policy for coca and cocaine. Um, it's a historically very difficult uh, and challenging issue, uh, how we address the reality of cocaine markets and cocaine use. Um, across the world. Um, there are a range of issues for producer countries, uh, transit countries, and primary consumer countries, and the fact that those are substantially merging. So there is actually a lot of cocaine use in, in uh, producer and transit countries as well. But it does have a unique dynamic like other plant-based drugs in that uh, it is a, an international market that is covered by international laws. Um, we've taken an enforcement approach to uh, cocaine for the last 50 years or more, um, and all the problems associated with cocaine and co cocaine use and cocaine markets seem to have just got worse and worse and worse. Um, so what we'd like to do today is to spend the short time we've got exploring some new ideas uh, about how we can rethink our approach to cocaine move away from some of the failings of the punitive uh, war on drugs paradigm and consider options for new thinking, including the possibility of uh, regulated markets for cocaine and coca based products. Um, we've got uh, three speakers here today, myself, um, I've had to step in as chair because uh, Jane Slater, who was um, supposed to be our chair, has unfortunately been indisposed. So I'm both chair and speaker. So I'm afraid you're going to get a double dose of me today, which um, may please some people and, and may please some people less. But nonetheless, I am chair and speaking. Um, we've also got uh, Lorenzo Uribe from Colombia who is the lead drafter of a bill that is being debated in the Colombian Senate tomorrow, I believe. Um, that looks to be the first um, legally, uh, to build, to produce, set up the first legally regulated market for coca and cocaine products for non-medical use anywhere in the world. So that it's a, a really groundbreaking piece of legislation and we've got the lead drafter here with us today. Um, and our other speaker is um, Lisa Sanchez, who is the director of Mexico Unido Contra de la Quencia, which I mentioned earlier, who's also been doing remarkable work in the area of drug policy and cocaine policy specifically. Um, the session is being recorded and will be on the CND website and the Transform YouTube channel. Uh, if you uh, miss any of it, or if you want to share it uh, later on. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please do put them in the, use the Q&A function on Zoom to add questions and we'll, we'll, we have some time at the end, hopefully for uh, Q&A. Um, please do also just say hello and tell us who you are and where you're from in the chat. Um, be lovely to see everybody and where, where people are from. Um, <clears throat> The other thing I wanted to mention as part of the introduction was that um, Transform does a lot of policy work, a lot of policy analysis, some of it really quite dry and functional and technocratic. Um, but we also have a campaign initiative called Anyone's Child, where people who have been impacted by the war on drugs, not just necessarily drug use, but the enforcement of drug laws, are able to tell their stories because we feel it's important not just to look at data points on a graph, but understand that many of those data points, or a lot of those figures that you see in the World Drug Reports, um, often really quite grim uh, looking statistics. Each one of those statistics is a human story, often a human tragedy. And we feel that it's really important um, to provide that human uh, element 
to the narrative so that we don't forget what we're actually doing here and why we are here. It's because the war on drugs and the current approach to policy and its focus on enforcement rather than health and well-being and human rights has often horrendous human consequences. So we have a, pro we have a project called Anyone's Child and the uh, affiliates across the world, including Anyone's Child in Mexico, where we provide a platform for people to tell their stories about how drug enforcement, rather than just drug use per se, has impacted on them and their loved ones. So people who have been bereaved by overdoses or have lost people who've been um, uh, harmed in drug related, drug war related violence or have had loved ones um, incarcerated and have been harmed in different ways. Um, and just before we start the presentations, I'd like to show a short film. Um, Esther, I hope you can queue up, uh, share screen and queue up the film, which is a story from one of our um, uh, representatives for anyone's child in Belgium called uh, Peter, who is a former policeman who lost his brother. I'll show that video now. Thank you, Esther. I'm Peter from Belgium, serving police officer for about 20 years now, deputy chief of police in Belgium. And when I hear all your stories, I'm not always as proud to be a policeman. Uh, 10 years ago, I lost my brother. He was taking an overdose on heroin, coke, uh, medication and alcohol and I have come to New York to stand up against the war on drugs because I'm convinced, I have become convinced that actual drug policy causes more harm than the drugs itself. I think police, we are trained to look at drug possession and drug use as criminal behavior which of course it isn't, it's, it's more like a health issue but it took me several years and, and all the experience with my brother to, to come to this insight. My brother Tom, uh, he was a skater, he was always looking for a kick, he was a very social guy, he had a lot of friends. He was 14 when he started to, to use a recreational drug and he never stopped. And I think he passed the line, I think he couldn't be clean anymore. We came into a phase where we have to face addiction learn to live with it and try to get some measures in place that he might still be using but not causing any harm to himself or society. My brother is not born as an addict person. My brother was born a fine young man with all the possibilities that I had, with all the, the chances in, in, in a nice environment. Due to circumstances he became drug addict but he didn't deserve to be stigmatized. He didn't deserve to be uh, looked at as a criminal, as, as, as an insect, as a lowlife. He was a person, he was a nice person with a problem. I think we should have dealt with the problem and not with the person. If drug policy were different and my brother wasn't labeled a criminal, I could have had a normal relationship with him. I could have helped him more. If people think that if we are going to legalize everything, then everybody's going to the supermarket and buy heroin and coke and buy the kilo, I think they are wrong because legalization has to go together with regulation, with, with, with licensing of tender points. It's, you, you, you are not going to allow minors to buy heroin. I've always been the police officer more than a brother. Maybe I should speak out more as a brother and less as a policeman. Thank you, thank you for, for that, Esther. Um, and I think that's a, it's a, the, the thing I like about that film is that um, it brings together so many themes that we're going to be talking about today. Because um, Peter is a you know he's a senior police. Sorry, sorry about that, I was muted. Um, the, the thing I like about that film is that uh, Peter was a, has been a policeman, um, senior policeman in Belgium, enforcing the drug laws for much of his professional life. 
Um, and it was only the experiences with his brother that forced him to sort of reevaluate a lot of what he was doing and the basis of a, a lot of that enforcement. And um, it made him question the overarching punitive paradigm. And, uh, and you know, his brother was, um, he, he used a, a number of drugs, I believe, but including, including cocaine. So it is relevant. And, you know, as I say, e the statistics that we see thrown around so much, not least in, in UN forums like the CND, Behind those statistics, there are many uh, heartbreaking um, personal stories like Peter's. Okay, um, I'm going to now, with, with my apologies, I'm going to move from my chairing and introduction role into my speaker role. Um, I'm going to uh, make a presentation, a short presentation um, about... Uh, uh, about the book that Transform have published. Hang on a moment, just let me wait for it to queue up. Uh, now, let me go back to the first page. So um, this is a book that we published uh, last October, How to Regulate Stimulants, A Practical Guide. Um, <clears throat> It, yeah, the, the debate around uh, the regulation of drugs um, has focused considerably in the last you know, five, 10 years, particularly around cannabis stuff. And that's where a lot of the action has been. Um, cannabis is being legalized across much of North America, much, much of the Americas. There was a referendum in New Zealand. Um, cannabis is being legalized in South Africa. Uh, Luxembourg is the first European country to legalize cannabis. Israel is legalizing cannabis. So there's a lot of stuff happening around cannabis. Um, which is understandable. It's the most used of the illegal drugs. Um, it's at the, the lower risk end of the, 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 the drug spectrum compared to many other drugs. Um, <clears throat> and it's the least threatening politically. So it's not surprising that a lot of activity is happening there. At the other end of the risk spectrum, um, with injectable drugs and um, even some stimulant drugs, we are beginning to see a debate around uh, medical provision to people whose use has become problematic. So we're seeing things like um, prescription of injectable heroin. Um, and in Canada, that debate is really blossoming around this concept of safe supply. So they're actually looking at uh, prescribing drugs or making drugs available through medical channels for people who are dependent or have drug problems. That includes uh, some stimulants, things like amphetamines, and even uh, benzodiazepines, as well as a range of opioids. So at, at either end of the, uh, the risk spectrum, if you like, so injectable heroin uh, at one end, um, cannabis at the other end, we're seeing real movement around the world in terms of um, regulated availability of drugs as an alternative to criminal markets and illegal supply. But in the middle, uh, between these two poles, there is this group of drugs, stimulants, and to a certain extent, psychedelics. Um, a group of drugs which aren't really getting much attention. And stimulants in particular, we felt, um, in our discussions with MUCD and other colleagues, we felt that stimulants were not getting any attention. Um, considerable problems that are associated with illegal markets and the drug use itself are driven by prohibition particularly for stimulants, but no one was really talking about it. Um, so it's these drugs that occupy this middle ground, the sort of mid-risk drugs, and many of which aren't used in the same sort of problematic ways, but are still associated with substantial problems, particularly around their production and supply that we wanted to focus on. So we've produced this book, um, it's available on our website to download for free, and it's also being translated into Spanish, and the Spanish version will be available very soon. Um, in terms of what we want uh, a, a regulated approach to um, stimulants, particularly in this case cocaine, to actually achieve, um, it's all the obvious stuff, and it, it, but, but it bears repeating, because if you look at what's driving a lot of um, uh, the discussions at CND and the war on drugs historically, it's all about um, deterring people from using drugs, using punishment and using enforcement to crush and eradicate drug production and interdict drug supply. 
there's 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 this preoccupation with creating a drug-free world and a lot of the metrics for evaluating and measuring policy are focused on that we'd like to refocus on what we actually want our drug policy to achieve in terms of protecting human rights in terms of protecting public health in terms of protecting young people and vulnerable populations in terms of ensuring equity and social justice for people who have been harmed by the war on drugs, to enhance security and development, particularly in producer and transit regions, and to actually meaningfully reduce crime, particularly associated with um, illegal drug markets and organized crime groups. Um, and really we need to have a, an evidence-based focus on delivering those goals and if we focus on those goals, I think we're in a much stronger position to actually debate which policies are going to be able to deliver those goals that we all share. Clearly, the war on drugs has not done any of those things. And in most cases, it's taken us further away from that. We hope that a, a public health based regulatory approach can help to deliver some of these shared goals. In terms of our overarching principles, we'd like to focus on um, in, in a post-prohibition world, learning the lessons from alcohol and tobacco so that we don't have over-commercialized um, markets that are driven by profit incentives rather than the public good. Um, we'd like to make sure that um, our policies are based on science and evidence rather than um, politics and geopolitics and uh, prohibitionist ideology. We'd like to see regulation models guided by the concept of risk so that more risky products or more risky behaviors are justified different levels uh, of regulation and the deployment of different regulatory tools. Clearly, you're not gonna regulate co cocaine in the same way that you would regulate cannabis and you're not gonna regulate cocaine in the same way that you would regulate injectable heroin. So we need a range of different approaches. It's not a once fits all model. And we need to be flexible. So we need to see what's working and what's not working and let policy and regulatory approaches evolve on the basis of that evidence. So moving on very quickly, um, in terms of production of cocaine, uh, we already produce cocaine legally and it's something that not, a great, uh, not many people necessarily know about, but we already produce cocaine legally um, for medical use. It's not a huge market, but it does exist. Coca leaf is grown in uh, Peru. It's flown by the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, to the US where it's processed by pharmaceutical companies into uh, pharmaceutical cocaine, which is sold around the world for medical use. Uh, and then the decocainized leaves are then sold to the Coca-Cola company to make Coca-Cola. So there is already a legal cocaine market. There's no mystery about how to do it. Um, <clears throat> but if we are going to move uh, from the situation we're in now to uh, a, a legally regulated production of coca and cocaine, we need to be thinking about sustainable development. And a lot of people and our other speakers, I'm sure we'll talk about this. A lot of people from marginalized, economically marginalized populations have moved into um, coca production and uh, to, to a lesser extent cocaine trafficking um, as a form of economic survival. It's not necessarily something they want to do, but if you are um, an economically marginalized population, it may be one of the few options that you have. So we need to be thinking about sustainable development, particularly for plant-based drugs, in this case, coca and cocaine. The products themselves, we don't want to see these things, uh, legal cocaine, should it emerge. We don't want to see it um, aggressively marketed in the way that we've seen with alcohol and tobacco products over the last century. And to some extent, some co uh, cannabis based products in emerging legal markets in the US. We would like to make these products available in a functional way, not a promotional way. So we think they should be marketed uh, and, and made available very much like uh, pharmaceutical drugs which is effectively what they are. So we've mocked up this packaging and on the left, you can see some mock-up packaging for a legal cocaine product, um, which looks very much like a pharmaceutical product and has very clear um, bold yellow boxes with appropriate health warnings um, and information about dosage and risk and where to find more information. So, um, the vendors, where would we make legal cocaine available? 
how would it be made available? Um, we've kind of alighted on, um, in our work, a state monopoly retail model that would keep commercial companies out of the market complete, as far as possible um, and leave control of the market to um, state monopoly retailers who we think would be better positioned to make responsible choices in the interests of the public. So there'll be a complete ban on all advertising and marketing. We would see sales from something that was more like a pharmacy where you have a trained individual who acts as a gatekeeper to legal access and is able to enforce rationing controls, uh, age access controls, and you know controls on whether or not someone is intoxicated when they are uh, buying. And then you would have controls on things like location, signage, hours of opening, all the more familiar dimensions of regulated, regulation that we see with other products like uh, alcohol, for example, or pharmaceuticals and pharmacies. Um, I think finally, it's, it's important to remember with something like cocaine, that coca leaf, cocaine powder, and crack cocaine are essentially all the same drug, but they come in very different forms that are associated with different behaviors and very different levels of risk. Coca leaf chewing, sort of traditional coca leaf chewing in the Andean region, isn't really associated with any medical or, or social harms at all. And in many ways, it's associated with many benefits. Cocaine powder obviously is much more of a mixed picture. Most cocaine powder, people who use cocaine powder do so occasionally and moderately and don't have any problems. But some people do obviously use too much and do um, either harm themselves or others. And with crack, because it's a much more concentrated, rapid, more intense uh, experience when you smoke it, or, or of course, if you're injecting cocaine powder, but I'm talking about crack here, um, it is associated with greater social and health harms. But again, not everybody who uses crack um, does so problematically. Nonetheless, we've got different products here, even though they contain the same drug, and we do need to have different approaches. So obviously you can have a much lighter touch approach to coca leaf. It's gonna be more like coffee or energy drinks. Cocaine powder is kind of what I've been talking about during the presentation. We need to have a kind of strictly regulated, rationed sales through pharmacies to adults. And crack, uh, smokable crack, we felt that there wasn't an, an, any obvious way to make that available under a retail model. But if you can buy cocaine powder, obviously you can make crack anyway. And if people were determined to use it, they were going to do that. So we would have a harm reduction approach, um, not a criminalized approach, but a harm reduction approach um, with a public health focus, um, including things like supervised consumption spaces and health and social support as needed. Um, all of this is explored in a lot more detail in the book. Uh, there is a lot of theory and practice um, described in there. There's a detailed um, section on coca and cocaine products. So please do access that book. You can download it for free. If you want to buy a print copy, you can, um, but the book is available as a free PDF. I hope people will look at it, uh, read it, um, and let us know your thoughts, because as much as anything, what we want to do is get the debate around stimulant regulation and cocaine regulation moving, because what is absolutely clear is that the status quo is not going to solve the problems um, that we're facing. They are only getting worse. We do need new thinking. Hopefully this book contributes to that. Um, and I would very much welcome uh, people reading it and, and letting us know what they think. Um, so I am now going to hand over to Lisa Sanchez, who is my uh, esteemed colleague uh, and director of MUCD in Mexico. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Steve. Um, thanks everybody for joining this event here in Latin America. It's incredibly early, so I am just thrilled to uh, having the opportunity opportunity of waking up and see uh, all these beautiful black boxes on Zoom, um, but with very dear names to me attached to them. So thank you so much for being here. Um, as Steve said, my name is Lisa Sanchez and I'm the general director of a of, um, um, Mexican NGO called Mexico United Against Crime. 
Uh, we've been involved in drug policy reform for the past, I don't know, over 10 years with the support of Transform. And uh, we've been very um, um, active in actually trying to imagine how to force police, um, policy reform, how to force social change, how to change the terms of the debate and actually try to help people imagine what a post-prohibition world would look like and what would be the benefits of actually trying alternative approaches to different drugs through different types of regulation, which is, I think, um, the best um, added value of publications and books like this that actually help people try to understand how to do it, what would the challenges be, what would the benefits be, and um, it provides, I think, a clear path on how to advance in terms of uh, policy reform, which I'm sure Lorenzo is going to um, support when approaching politicians in, 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 in other countries, particularly producing and, and transit countries. One of the most important things is actually um, having some sort of recipe or at least some sort of um, pathway um, to help them uh, transit to a, a different approach and to better policies. So with that said, um, why did we get involved in drug policy? Well, basically because as you all know, Mexico has been suffering the negative impacts of drug prohibition, but also of war on drugs like policies. Um, for the past 20 years, if not more. But ever since 2006, when um, former President Calderon declared a full frontal combat against illicit or um, drug trafficking and against the organizations that were trafficking with drugs, um, basically security indicators, violence indicators, human rights indicators, um, democracy indicators even, um, were really affected in Mexico and the negative impacts were incredibly high um, in terms of violence, in terms of waste of public resources, in, in terms of failing to address the public problems that we were actually facing like insecurity or actually dealing with the public health phenomena that drugs represented in our country. Um, we started working on drug policy reform around uh, 2010, basically trying to imagine um, how to force um, that political and social change in Mexico. And we basically used book like this, but we used the first transform book that, that was about how to regulate drugs and what regulation meant. Then we started using a second book that was how to regulate cannabis. And we started you know, changing the terms of the debate. Now we're gonna use this book. Um, but, but, but the use of all of this, the use of all of these resources and, around, and, and, and the creation and implementation of a strategy that was a little more comprehensive and basically try to uh, attack public opinion, but at the same time, try to influence uh, decision makers and at the same time, went to tribunals to actually make um, judicial cases against prohibition helped us win um, the, first, the first very victories in Mexico and I think in all, in all Latin America in which the Supreme Court uh, basically agreed with us that um, using drugs was part of a human right uh, that was already acknowledged in our constitution that was the right to, for one to develop its own personality. Um, so we succeeded at, at pursuing that strategy with cannabis, and then we started thinking, okay, so if cannabis is the most consumed, consumed drug in Mexico, cannabis is also the most uh, enforced um, substance in, in, in Mexico, it's, it's what causes the most seizing, it's what causing the, the most arrests in terms of violating drug uh, laws. It's definitely um, effective and it's only logical to start with cannabis, but our problems as a producer country and as a transit country of several different drugs, it's not the end of our fight and cannabis cannot be the only substance that we actually pay attention to. So we started it trying to imagine whether those cases could be applied to cocaine. And we decided that they could because the same problems that happen with cannabis happened with cocaine. And it's no surprise, and I know you all know this, but for example, in Mexico, 82% of the people that were actually arrested 
in a year for violating drug laws were arrested for simple possession of small quantities of drugs. And if you actually go into the numbers and see what were the substances that these people were carrying, you could see that yes, cannabis is the first with over 30% of total arrests, but then it comes cocaine with 17% of the adults that were arrested for simple possession of small quantities and 6% of the adolescents that were also arrested for possessing small quantities of uh, cocaine. If you go into the numbers historically of what has been empowering criminal organizations here in Mexico, you can also see that cocaine for many, many years over, over a decade was actually the most profitable substance that was uh, providing these criminal organizations with an enormous amount of resources. And if you actually go and see what the anti-drug actions were uh, in Mexico for decades, you can see that yes, eradication of illicit crops such as cocaine or poppy were a big part of um, the actions that our military was actually doing in, in, in terms of enforcing drug laws and fighting this drug war. But cocaine seizing and, 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 per, and prosecution was actually another or the second largest anti-drug action that our military was conducting with uh, an average of nine tons seized every year with peaks of having years in which our military basically secured over 40 tons of cocaine and arrested hundreds of thousands of people. So basically, knowing that we have the same public problem that we have with cannabis, which is we are a transit country for cocaine, we're not necessarily a producing country for cocaine, but we're actually enforcing drug laws that are criminalizing users that are doing nothing to address the public health consequences of this, that it's causing violence, that we're empowering a legal market that is disrupting uh, pretty much the entire life of Mexico. And knowing as well that ever, to, ever since 2006, we've been militarizing the drug um, um, or drug efforts. And now, because of that militarization of drug policy and drug um, and anti-drug actions, we're basically uh, enabled the militarization of the rest of public security with the attached costs that that policy choice has in terms of human rights, in terms of violence, in terms of failing really to address and contain violence, insecurity, delinquency, et cetera, we just decided that it was too much to bear, that it was unsustainable and that we needed to do something. So we basically use, and I'm gonna close with this, we use the same arguments that we used with cannabis as to say uh, possession is um, um, the lack, sorry, the lack of um, legal sources for cocaine users to um, get their drug and, and, and basically use it responsibly as adults um, is basically causing that these people uh, actually go to an illegal market that is empowering criminals, that is causing violence, that it's fueling conflict in Mexico. And it shouldn't be that way, because if you had secure um, supply sources, all these people could one, be better addressed by the public health system in case they need an intervention, but B, you would actually prioritize differently your policing, your judiciary, your law enforcement resources, and you could actually be more effective at trying to fight crime if you stop criminalizing, arresting, and processing these people. And um, just to conclude, as uh, with, with a little good news and, and, and not on the, on the negative side of what the drug war has caused in Mexico, basically one court agreed with us. And last um, two years ago in 2019, we basically won the first court case. It was a, a regular tribunal, not the Supreme Court, but it was the very first case in which a judge agree that uh, that legal legal supplies and safe supplies sources should also be available for users of for drug users other than cannabis users and we're basically trying to push those cases to get to the supreme court and then provide us with some um, jurisprudence or some sort of legal criteria that can help us stop criminalizing people who are using cocaine and advance this debate about how to regulate cocaine or stimulants, knowing that we have 
very different problems that my friend Lorenzo here present uh, have as we're not a producing country. So um, just to say that these particular materials have been incredibly helpful, that they can actually um, um, improve the advocacy work and the legal work and the lobbying work that we do as organizations in our countries. And that with this type of information, along with evidence of the failure of the war on drugs, you can actually advance your cause whenever you are, it's either Mexico or the UK or Colombia. So thank you very much again for having me here. It was a real pleasure and I give it back to you, Steve, you have the floor again. Um, to <laughs> Thanks very much, Lisa. Leave it to Lorenzo. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, re really, really useful points there. And I, and I think I particularly take away the point that, you know, even though cat cocaine is a very different drug to cannabis, um, and it's, you know, I think most people would accept it's, it's a more risky drug than cannabis, the same arguments for, for, for moving from a, a criminal justice approach to a, uh, 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 a regulation approach uh, apply. It, it, because, you know, however risky a particular drug is, um, a war on drugs and a, and a punitive approach just makes all the problems worse. And we, we just, it, it's a, it, there, there's, a, there's an ideological shift from an enforcement prohibitionist approach to a public health and human rights approach. Obviously what manifests from that will be different for different drugs, but set, the arguments are essentially um, all the same. But the, the important thing is that it's actually moving from um, theory into practice. And that's what we're now gonna hear a bit about from uh, Lorenzo. So we're running a little bit late, Lorenzo, but you can still have your 10 minutes. We may not have that much time for Q and A, um, but Lorenzo is actually doing it on the ground in Colombia, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve. And thanks everyone, especially Transform for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here uh, and uh, have the opportunity to share our experience introducing the first bill to regulate all the stages of the cocaine and coca market in Colombia. And probably it's also the first uh, attempt in the world. And I'm particularly happy to do this uh, in this uh, 64th session of the CND. So I would like to use my time to tell you first why we decided to regulate the coca and cocaine market in Colombia. Then I will move to the details of the bill, what we are trying to do exactly, and then give you uh, an overall like context of where things stands, how uh, the response to this bill has been, and then conclude. Um, next, please, Mister. Next slide. So um, you know when the policy has failed over and over again, and I think both uh, Steve and Alisa have mentioned it. I think the natural thing to do is to reconsider that policy. And in the case of Colombia, this policy, the war on drugs, prohibitionism, has not only failed, it has also brought immense sufferings to Colombia. So why has it failed? Um, it's failed because the production of cocaine has remained, uh, has increased over the past years. Actually, it has increased by 120% between 2008 and 2018. And at the same time, the price and the purity have stayed more or less constant, meaning that the approach to reduce the supply of coca cocaine is not really working. But it's not only not working, it's also causing a lot of suffering in terms of development and human rights in Colombia. So I have a few facts to show you this. First, it's uh, the war on drugs is causing thousands of deaths every year directly associated to the war on drugs. It's estimated that this is around like 3,800 homicides per year are associated to the war on drugs in Colombia. It's cost a lot of money to the Colombian government, billions of dollars that cannot be used to other social programs and they're being spent on uh, coca eradication policies. This is equivalent, for example, between 2005 and 2014, the money spent on coca eradication by the Colombian government was equivalent to 50 years of the annual budget of the Ministry of Agriculture, to give you an idea of the quantity of money that is being wasted in a policy that is actually not working. It's also uh, had huge negative consequences on the environment. In 2017, for example, 24% of the deforestation was thought to be caused by coca plantations. Why? Because since this is an illegal activity, farmers have to hide and they have to like grow coca beyond the agricultural frontier. And this of course uh, causes uh, deforestation. It's also in terms of human rights, a very, very, very uh, harming policy. It's a major source of overcrowding to give you some numbers again, on average between 2005 and 2014, 
Uh, nine people were ever arrested every hour in Colombia because of drug-related crimes. And as Lisa said, most of the time it's for very minor crimes, which are committed by, uh, in large part, vulnerable sections of the population. And last but not least, and it's probably the fact we are most aware of, it's fueled corruption and political instability in the country over the past decades. So, um, of course, this is not going to be easy, but we think that Colombia is a good place to start. And being one of the most affected countries, I think it's uh, reasonable to start the conversation in Colombia. So, of course, these are facts that we all know about, or most of us know about. Why did this happen now? Why did we decide to introduce this bill uh, last year? I think here is where like the macro context meets like the personal, personal stories. And uh, it's because the senator I was working for, Ivan Marulanda from the Green Party, is a senator who was in politics 30 years ago. He was part of a minority, poli uh, minority political party whose main flag at the time was to fight the increasing uh, influence of drug cartels in politics. And as a result of that fight, uh, most of his uh, colleagues were killed including the presidential candidate at the time who was about to win the election in 1990 with Carlos Galan. And so 30 years after that failure of trying to counteract the increasing influence of drug cartels, he reached the conclusion that the only way to actually um, win was by regulating this market. And so that's why uh, since his arrival in office, we've been working on this bill, which was introduced last year in June and we hope it's going to get this to us, as Steve mentioned, tomorrow. So I think it's a perfect timing. Uh, uh, next, uh, please, Mr. So this is just a quick uh, view of who the senators are. On the left, it's Iwan Marulanda, and on the right is Feliciano Valencia, the indigenous senator who is also uh, one of the others of this bill. Thanks, uh, next, please. Thank you. So what is this bill about? The bill is trying to regulate all stages of the coca and cocaine market, from coca cultivation to retail and consumption. So I will try to be brief because we are actually following most of the recommendations that Steve mentioned in his book. So for the cultivation, the idea is that coca plantations will only be authorized in the areas where coca is currently being grown, as long as they remain outside of the environmentally protected areas. So this is to ensure that the market benefits the areas and communities most affected by the war on drugs and prevent new actors and potential, with potential advantages from entering the market. So the idea is first to ensure that this new legal framework benefits uh, vulnerable communities, but also the idea is to repair the damages caused by the war on drugs on these communities. What about production? So once you have this coca harvest. The idea is that the state will buy the harvest required to meet the demand of the legal cocaine market, both at the national level and at the international level, if some countries are willing to import cocaine and uh, coca-based products legally. Then the state with this harvest will subcontract the transformation of the coca leaf into cocaine through research centers and laboratories. So this will only be for all the coca that will be used for cocaine. Like all other uh, uses of the coca plant will be left free to the market. And the last stage, retail and consumption, we are actually following again uh, Transform's three-tier approach based on the level of risk of each product. So depending on the risk that each product causes to health, the regulation will be different. So the first set of regulations will cover low potency or non-psychoactive products, such as the coca leaf itself, or like beverages, food, cosmetic pro products based on the coca leaf. And in this case, the regulation will be very similar to the one already in place for products such as coffee, where private actors will be allowed to buy and sell these products more or less freely. The second type of regulation will include cocaine, and will cover psychoactive products derived from the coca leaf that are used for mainly recreational purposes. In this case, the regulation will be a bit more strict and um, you will have, consumers will have to go through a medical checkup and register in a database before being allowed to buy a certain dose of cocaine in registered pharmacies. Of course, 
all types of advertisements and sponsoring will be forbidden and only adults will be allowed to purchase cocaine. The third set of regulations will be much more stricter and they will cover uh, products like crack cocaine that will remain prohibited but will not be criminalized. And the idea is that in this case, a harm reduction strategy will be adopted. Uh, next slide, please. So this is about the bill. I want to first tell you very quickly what the political reaction, political response to this bill has been. It's been overwhelmingly positive. Actually, we were very surprised. This bill was uh, supported by 20 congressmen in Colombia. Most of the comments have been positive. It's also received and this policy is actually supported by uh, politicians from all over the political spectrum from right to left. And uh, as I mentioned, it's supposed to get discussed tomorrow. We know the chances that this is going to pass are very slim, but the idea is to put the debate into the, in the agenda and for the first time move from the diagnostic that the war on drugs has failed to a concrete proposal and a concrete proposal in the political sphere because what happens usually especially in Colombia is that only retired politicians start debating and talking about regulation but once they retire in this case it's a current senator that is bringing the debate so we think that also has a value added of course this is not going to solve all problems and uh, as long as for example international markets uh, keep uh, cocaine illegal this uh, is not going to solve all problems, but we think uh, Colombia is a good place to start and we need to start from somewhere. So this is why we decided to do this. I think I will leave it here so that we have at least a few minutes for, for questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, there was actually a, there's actually a question um, in the in the comments about uh, what, what the public response has been to it. I'm actually quite interested to know and, and for, for you, Lisa, as well. I'm conscious that we've got like five minutes, so just really the 30 second answers. But what's the public reaction and the media reaction been both to the bill in, in Colombia and, and the Supreme Court case in, in Mexico? Lorenzo, do you want to go first? Yes. So as I mentioned, I think the response has been overwhelmingly positive. So, of course, like the government, for example, is uh, opposing it. But I think especially in urban areas, younger generations have come to the conclusion that uh, this is the only way to go about. So as I mentioned, I think there is a consensus about the failure of the current approach, but not many people have actually thought about what we can do. And I think that's why we are doing this. It's like a first attempt to say like, well, we don't know exactly how to do it, but let's discuss about the how and not just stay on the, oh, it's failed, which there, I think there is a consensus. And on the how, I think the conversation is still at a very early stage. But I think people were very happy to have this debate, this debate opened. And what, what about in Mexico, Lisa? Did everyone think you were crazy? Most people, but I think that the most worrying part was that um, when, the, when the case reached the Supreme Court finally last year, the arguments that the justice was using um, to um, rule against it were pretty much arguments that we would listen in 1970s or 1980s. So one of the main use of these cases was for us to be able to put out there in the public debate updated evidence about cocaine use, cocaine um, um, uh, production, uh, cocaine enforcement, uh, coca-based products instead of you know separating coca, coca from cocaine. Um, and, and pretty much informed the debate throughout. What's interesting though, is that when we first won this case, um, not yet at the Supreme Court, but in the first um, level of the, of the judiciary, what was unleashed was a very specific reaction from the US government uh, that basically strongly opposed for this debate to advance in Mexico and that had organizational impacts and whatnot. Uh, it was the Trump administration, so hopefully with the renewal of the American government, we will actually have a little bit more space to have a debate like this, uh, but it got a very strong reaction. Yet, I just want to, 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 to encourage people to continue to have this conversation. The amount of information that we actually managed to gather with the case 
was actually um, a, a positive effect of the case itself, even if we're not winning that legal strategy just yet. So do it, go for it, have the opportunity to move things on the ground and share information because it's basically what we need to move forward. Fantastic. And um, we, we are, I'm afraid we're pretty much out of time. So I'm just going to conclude by kind of reinforcing what, what Lisa and, and um, Lorenzo have just said, which is that this, this debate around um, regulation of drugs other than cannabis is really, a, it, it's, um, it's at its early stages. But we need to, and, and you know, and hopefully the work that uh, Lorenzo is doing and, and Lisa and MUC doing and Transformer doing and, and the book um, uh, and, and other work other people are doing around the world, because it's not just us, um, is going to accelerate and inform that debate. But it's just, it is a debate we need to have. Like, it couldn't be clearer that prohibition of cocaine and other drugs and the war on drugs is not working. The status quo is not sustainable. We need to be looking at what the alternatives are and how they will work. And that, that means having precisely these debates. How do you regulate different drugs associated with, associated with different um, sets of risks and different behaviors in different environments? Because it's not gonna be the same between different countries. It's not gonna be the same between different drugs. There's a lot to think about here and a lot of difficult questions. And it takes time for the public to get to and really get their heads around and engage with these questions. It took years with cannabis. It's gonna take some time with um, more time arguably with, with more difficult, more cha politically challenging drugs, which are more associated with threat and concerns in, in the public mind. But we have to start somewhere. That work is happening. Um, I would really encourage you all to engage with that work, the work of the different organizations, the work of Transform, um, do take a look at that book. I'm afraid we don't have any more time to um, look at some of the questions that are coming in. But if you do have questions, please do contact Transform or MUCD. Um, you can ask some questions now on Twitter to uh, Lisa, myself, or um, uh, Lorenzo. Um, thank you for, for joining us. Please do read the book. Um, I look forward to taking this debate forward um, in the UN and, and everywhere else. So thank you very much and goodbye.